Hello and welcome to Synchronicity, talk radio for your mind, body, and soul. I'm your host, Marie Bernard. This is CITR 101.9 FM in Vancouver, or you might be listening online at CosmicDimensions.com, EmpowerRadio.com, on the Co-Creator Network, or of course at CITR.ca, or on my YouTube page, which is youtube.com forward slash spiritual show. And we have a return guest today, first time this year so far. And her name is Wendy Newman. She's been on the show a couple of times. And Wendy is the author of 101 First Dates. And she has taught over 100 workshops and spoken to thousands of men and women across the US and Canada. And she is a dating relationship and sex educator. And we're going to be speaking with her again today. I'm so excited to have her back on the show. Welcome. Happy New Year, Wendy. Hi, Marie. Thank you for having me back. Yay, it's always always a pleasure to chat with you. So what have you been up to since the last time you were on the show? Oh, so much. Been leading workshops. I turned in my book to the publisher. I'm so excited that it's getting published. I'm working on that all this year. So... It's an exciting year so far. Cool. And you are you just did a, a tele-summit. I don't think your interview is up anymore, but uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I did a Ready for the Right Guy tele-summit with John Gray and Alison Armstrong and a whole host of other leading experts in the dating and mating and love field. And it's been a really great experience to be with them and, and to be giving the gift of what we've learned and what we've seen and what we've studied. Cool. Yeah, I heard the the interview with Alison Armstrong and I heard your interview. I haven't listened to any of the... Oh, and um, the men are from Mars guy. Um, yeah, John, John Gray. Gray. Yeah, so I, I heard those three interviews. Those were the only ones that I, that I listened to, but they were all really good. And I'm curious if there's any... Because you and Alison are always kind of doing your man research... So is there anything new and cutting edge that you feel like you need to get off your chest right now? (laughs) The newest, the latest, the greatest. There are things that I have known for a very long time, but there's putting them all together so they all click in and make sense. Those are the things that the things that I'm most excited about have to do with women who have that nagging complaint about being strong and successful and smart, and men feel intimidated by that. Now, I've known for years and years that men aren't intimidated by strong, successful women. I've known that, and it's really hard to convey that, and I'm just starting to see in the conversations I've been having with men and digging in a little bit deeper what's behind that and what what's that all about, really. So I already knew when I talked to men, and I'd ask them over and over, what was intimidating intimidating about strong successful and say well when i was 14 i was intimidated but i'm not intimidated now and those qualities you know the qualities of strong and successful and smart those qualities on their own are not inherently intimidating and i got kind of digging in to find out what was really going on there and what what it has a lot to do with is our receptivity our, our constant, I got this, I got this handled, I got this, has, has them not have anywhere to go with you. And on the same, on the same path, the, the need to not outsmart each other, but when you're dating, it's almost a, not necessarily a one-upmanship, but he's been to 20 countries. Oh, you've only been to 20 countries? I've been to 27 always having more, needing more, expressing more. There's no ability for him to ever impress you. He has nothing to give you. He has nothing new for you because we've already done it all ourselves. So I'm starting to really work with women on how to be themselves and to not dumb themselves down and be the woman who's been to 44 countries, but to be able to express herself in a way that men still have somewhere to go with her to contribute to her. That is so funny. Something similar, uh, not with a guy I'm dating, but a, a guy that I'm friends with. He was telling me he was really excited about this um, kind of Canadian celebrity that he had met and who was it, um, 
someone that he really admired and he was going on and on and on and on about it. And he was, it was from years and years ago. He's telling me the story and I felt like I was like, Oh, well that's nothing. I've interviewed Alana miles and blah, 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 which is another amazing Canadian celebrity. But I bit my tongue cause I was like, it, I knew if I said anything, it would totally deflate his excitement. Mm-hmm. So I sat yeah. there and I just enjoyed him telling the story and you know, I can tell him about that another day. I don't cuz I feel I felt like this this urge to be like oh well that's nothing I I've, I've done this and that and that and there is that urge to kind of compete. Yeah. Yeah, and the minute we do that, you use the exact precise word compete. The minute we begin to compete, that's a masculine trait and what we don't even know we're causing in that moment of competition is game on. And you never, ever, ever want to be on a date where you have caused a man to say game on because you've just shifted everything. You've shifted his ability to be open with you and get to know you and give to you whatever he has to give, whether it's the gift of storytelling or the gift of that delicious dinner or just whatever generosity he has goes out the window with game on because now he's in competition. Game on. Okay. Now we've flipped it to adversarial. So instead of taking care of you, it flips to competing with you. It's not lovely. Yeah. And we didn't even mean it. We didn't even mean to. We didn't even know what we were causing. Well, that's the thing. And I'm, I'm wondering why we do that. Even, I mean, uh, we'll do it with our girlfriends too. Like even when, when people will... St- will call to vent about their problems. A lot of times we'll be like, oh, well, that's nothing. I've had the even worse day than you. So we always, not always, but people, human beings tend to have this need to one up each other. And I'm wondering where that comes from. Yeah, it's just a knee jerk. It's just a knee jerk response that humans have. And you caught yourself in that moment. You brought your consciousness to that moment and said, you know what? I'm going to save my story. So all that is is kind of that knee-jerk compulsion or expression to share, to connect. I mean, we need to connect. And for a woman, that that moment of trying to get yours in is a, oh, me too. Oh, me too. You had a horrible day. Oh, me too. And there's some relief when we have the connection to see that we're the same. Oh, okay, oh, me too. We're, we're connected. We're the same. We can relate to each other. We're on the same page. And let me show them something else. Let me share something else with them that's bigger, that they can relate to that too. So it's not necessarily coming from a bad place at all. It's just not bad, not good, neither. It's just instinct trying to have you have an oh, me too moment and connect and share yourself. But it has a negative effect that we don't anticipate yeah. Mm, it's interesting too because this same person, um, I, I phrased, I, I really wanted a ride on New Year's Eve and I texted him and again, this is just a friend. I texted him and let him know like what it would provide for me if he would give me a ride. Like I'd re- it really make me happy if you gave me a ride if, if it's not too much trouble because then I'd be much more relaxed and I'd be able to have a, a fun night and whatever. Anyway, it worked so well. Not only did he pick me up, but he decided that he had to wash the car first before he came and got me because I'd asked him so nicely. Good job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's interesting when we shift from adversarial to I mean, what would you call that when you're when you're asking in that way? Well, you're just open. You're just open for the connection. You're open for his generosity to step in instead of doing the normal thing we do of, I got this. You know, that strong, successful woman would not have asked for a ride. She would have called a cab if she didn't want to drive, or she would have handled it herself. She would have driven herself, even if she didn't feel like it. I got this. I don't, I don't need anybody for anything. I don't need you to help me out and come pick me up. It's it's normal for us to be like that because for the last 40, 50 years, our culture has been training us to be like that, that to be 
that that's a value trait to be self-sufficient. And we've confused self-confidence with self-sufficiency. They're different. It took some confidence for you, some self-confidence, for you to ask for what you needed from your friend. And he saw that confidence and you gave him space to provide something and he happened to be wanting to do that for you. You know, obviously it's not going to happen every time with every request we ever have of men or women, but I don't know about you, but I'm delighted to give things to my friends when they ask. And if I have the space to wash my car first, uh uh-huh, I'll do that. (laughs) But often we don't ask because we don't want to be any burden. We don't want to be a bother. Mm. And then what happens is, and I have I have this thing too, I end up doing everything on my own. I feel like I have to do everything by myself and then I get overwhelmed. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I want to share something that I experienced between Canadian women and American women. Okay. I started leading workshops in Canada in... Oh, probably about nine years ago. And in a year of, of nine years ago, for a year long, I came up to, I came up to um, Edmonton and Calgary nine times. So I got to know the differences between American women in a workshop and Canadian women in a workshop. And what was so beautifully delightful about Canadian women is you have this yummy sisterhood, at least in the workshop room, this yummy sisterhood of helpfulness. And I I wondered, even if you didn't know this woman, you had this kindness, this helpfulness that you just don't see in, say, Los Angeles. (laughs) And I'm wondering if it's a weather thing. You know, in Los Angeles, no one's going to die if they have to go start their car at 6 in the morning in January. In Edmonton, there might be a problem. (laughs) So I actually have a curiosity to know Regionally, when weather is harsh, are you more feminine? Are you more generous? (laughs) Are you more willing to say, I need your help? What do you think about that, Marie? Uh, That's actually really interesting because you were saying American and Canadian. And when you said Alberta, I I was like, Alberta women are way different than Vancouver people. Mm -hmm. Uh, Very Mm -hmm. different. And Mm -hmm. in a lovely way, I have a friend who lives in Vancouver half the time and in Edmonton half the time. And we talk about this every time we get together, the differences. And and I truly do believe it is because of weather. Because in Vancouver, you can be, I mean, we have a big enough city where you can be a jerk to someone and probably never bump into them again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you Mm -hmm. can go out and climb the mountains all by yourself and everything you need. You don't have to necessarily rely on anyone in Alberta if you don't have friends over the winter you Mm -hmm. will suffer greatly (laughs) you have to be kind to people so my Vancouver sisters are just like me in San Francisco then (laughs) similar yeah yeah And that's very interesting. Yeah, we definitely need, uh, and I know, because Wendy works with Alison Armstrong, the, the PAX organization, and among other things. Um, and I totally feel like we need PAX here. We need to have the, the Queen's Code workshops here because um, there are so many amazing, beautiful, well-educated, successful women in Vancouver. And they're single and they don't know why. And you know why. <laughs> because they're adversarial with men. But um, yeah, we don't, we, the women here have a, a problem. And I, I'm, we're talking in generalities. I don't want to get hate mail. Um, we're just talking in regional generalities and the difference between big cities and smaller cities. And um, yeah, there's definitely a difference. Yeah, and nobody's doing anything wrong. We're doing what we've been taught. What the things we teach at PECS programs and that I help women one-on-one, I'm bucking the system. I'm bucking your instinct. I'm bucking our culture. I'm bucking everything your mom's, 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 mom taught each other for all those years and all those generations. Anything they've heard us talk about that seems negative, please hear me. I don't mean it that you're doing anything wrong. You're doing just as you should based on your instincts and what you were taught. And I happen to know, based on the 12 years, 13 years of being involved with this program and with understanding men the way I do, 
there's something a lot tastier out there than than what we were handed. Mm, well, that is the perfect time to take a break. This is Synchronicity Talk Radio for your mind, body, and soul. I'm your host, Marie Bernard, and we are speaking right now with Wendy Newman, and you can find her at Wendy Speaks. Dot com, and we'll be back with more synchronicity in just a moment. Welcome back to Synchronicity Talk Radio for your mind, body, and soul. I'm your host, Marie Bernard, and we are speaking right now with Wendy Newman. She is a love, sex, dating, and relationships educator. She does workshops all over Canada and the U.S., and you can find her at wendyspeaks.com. Welcome back to the show, Wendy. Thanks for having me back. Yay. So, yeah, I wanted to talk. We we were talking before the break about um, kind of not being in competition with the men that we want to date. And um, this isn't just with with men we're romantically involved with, because I have a I emailed you a question the other day about uh, a man. This this person who had given me a ride on New Year's also wanted to provide um, quite a significant gift. He made a significant contrib- contribution to my life. And I was a little bit nervous about it because I wasn't sure, does this mean he wants to date me? Does this mean he's looking for something? And so you said we would talk about setting boundaries around gifts. <laughs> it's setting boundaries and just really checking out what is it that they're going to expect if they're going to expect anything. You know, gift is something that you would give someone because you want to, and there's nothing you need in return, and they're free to do it. With, they're free to do with it whatever you want, whatever they want to. You would hope that they would use it for what you had intended, but honestly, if you're giving a gift, you could state what you think it would be best used for. But it's a gift, so once it's out of your hands, it's out of your hands. It's not a loan. It's a gift. So, so one of the problems that I noticed that I have as a woman and that I've talked to my girlfriends about that they have as women is we get confronted with all the different pieces. We could be overwhelmed with the generosity of the size of the gift, whether it's a an expensive gift or just something so out of our own reach that we can't believe that this has come our way the gift of an opportunity into something that you would have never been able to get into on your own, a private club or connections or connections in Hollywood or <laughs> whatever, right? <laughs> so so we can become overwhelmed by its size and we can, I, don't want, I was about to say lose receptivity, but we don't even have it to begin with, the receptivity for certain gifts that are over our own sort of receiving threshold. So we can be overwhelmed by the actual gift, the Mm -hmm. magnitude of the gift. Then we begin to wonder, what do they expect in return? And do I want to give what I'm going to assume that they're going to expect in return? And what does this obligate me to, and et cetera, et cetera. But now not only are you wondering that and wondering if you have to fulfill on what you're assuming that comes with that gift, the, the need, right, now you're also overwhelmed by the fact that you have to talk to them about it. And it might be really embarrassing, especially if it's around you think he's romantically interested in you and you're not. You don't want to be displeasing. You do everything you can to avoid displeasing your friend because you like him as a friend and you want to keep him as a friend. But now this big gift has come up and that might get in the way. So <laughs> all there is to do is take a really deep, deep breath and hack away at it one piece at a time. One piece at a time is if they're going to give you a gift that's so enormous, your job is to breathe into, can I receive that size of a gift? And what are the types of things I need to have this conversation with him about? And the most important thing is to have the conversation. Instead of just saying, oh, no, no, I can't take that. Thank you for offering, but no. You could say, wow, 14 days in the Caribbean. (laughs) That's an amazing trip. Ooh, in June, I have that week off. Ah, let's make it February. June would be terrible in the Caribbean. January, (laughs) I have those days off. Yum. Hey, there's something I need to check out with you before I say yes to this gift. 
and then you can put in your boundaries and your concerns, your questions. If I if I say yes to the Caribbean in January with you, does this mean you want to be my girlfriend, boyfriend? Does this mean you want me to be your girlfriend? Because I'm actually not available for that. But if we're going to go as friends and we get a, two separate rooms side by side, we could get an adjoining door, that would be amazing. That gift might have just gone away, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> But then you could, you know, stating what it is that you need to not be putting up with something that you're not ready for, you're not interested in, right? Say, putting your boundary in with a yes allows you to receive the gift that he has to give and not obligate you to something that you have no interest in. Hmm. Or, you know, you might need to have a retools that conversation. Wow, you want to go two weeks in the Caribbean with me? Ooh, that'd be so delicious. I know we're newly dating, and I'm not quite ready for that step. I know you want to go in January. I think I'd be ready. I think I'd be ready for the Caribbean by the end of March. Can you wait that long so we can date a little bit more? I can get to know you better. But we don't think to counter. Often we just think to veto. No, 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 no. I can't do that. It's too overwhelming. He wants to give me a very large gift of money. I can't do that. And especially when it comes to money, we get a little bit wonky because, like I said, we think it obligates us to something. But often what you find out is it just obligates you for being thankful because I wanted to give you that gift. I had a friend for years and years while I was single who lived um, in Seattle. He was one of the many Seattle Microsoft millionaires, and he would send me money, and it would, and we were not dating, and he was not interested in me. I'm not at all his type. And I would have this panicked moment of, oh, can I receive this? But when he'd sent it, he'd tell me what he wanted me to spend it on, and why. And so when I thanked him, I never thanked him for the money. I thanked him for what it provided. He would send me money, and he would write a note saying, I know you're going to be leading in Los Angeles, and I know you're used to wearing black in San Francisco, and I know that you're worried about them judging you. Go buy a new outfit. Uh-huh. So, so as I would write him the thank you, oh, Robert, thank you so much for the outfit I got. It's this color. It's amazing. It's my right color palette. Women who might be judging me can judge how fabulous I look in this outfit. <laughs> if it's my body right, thank you so much for giving me the confidence I need to change their lives there. And that's all he ever wanted. All he ever wanted was appreciation for what he provided, which was the difference it made in my life in that moment to be confident and to get myself out of the way so I could be there for the women. Mm. Basically, he wrote me a check to change lives of women in Los Angeles. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. And I really, I love, um, I mean, I felt like with this situation, I, yeah, I didn't know what to do. I was a little bit overwhelmed. Um, it was very kind and generous um, to offer to purchase this thing for me. And I didn't think that he was trying to get anything in return, but I did have concerns about like whether that meant he was into me or or not. Um, But I just asked him, I I said, you know, do you want me to accept this gift? And he was like, well, yeah, of course. And so I said, okay, I will. And, and I did kind of talk about it um, a little bit because my best friend was sort of, he said, oh, that, I'm kind of concerned about this, you know, he might be looking for something from you. And so I just kind of let him know what my friend had said. And he's like, Oh, well, he, he doesn't know me. And, and you know, that I, that's not what I'm after. And I was like, yeah, I just wanted to make sure, you know, so we're on the same page and it went well. Um, but it's interesting being able to receive even just from, uh, from female friends as well. I think that a lot of we've been trained just not to accept things. Yeah, and not to ask for help and not to be receptive. Well, and you asked him a question that was probably confusing to him. And the question was, do you want me to receive this? Men 
this is one of the fundamental differences between men and women, and I'm generalizing like crazy here, so there you have it. But men only offer when they want to. Often we women don't. We offer things all the time, hoping the other person will say no. But it'll make us look really good that we offered to a good person for offering. <laughs> <laughs> Men don't generally do that. Is Pretty that neat, right? So now you know the now you know the sneaky secret. If he's offering, he wants to. Yay! <laughs> So is it because I kind of I felt weird about except I mean, I wanted to accept it. And I felt like if he's offering then because I know that about, uh, again, generalizing that that when men offer something, they generally want you to accept it. Um, So I also wanted to give him that gift of me being receptive and appreciative of of what he was providing. Um, Mm -hmm. But it did it did still feel a little bit awkward. Yeah. Because it was just so big. I mean, yeah. if it was like a candy bar, I'd be like, oh, thanks. But uh, it was yeah. significantly bigger than that. So That makes sense. Yeah. That's your instinct. Yeah. And it's like, and then, and I also noticed, um, one thing I noticed is I'm actually, and I don't feel like we'd be compatible for a relationship, but I did mm-hmm. notice that I was more attracted to him after accepting that gift. Is that normal? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, because it's somebody taking care of you. I can speak to this right this very second because my mother just helped me with something. And I rarely reach out to people for help (laughs) because I'm a woman. (laughs) But I reached out to my mom for help. And she said, oh, God, absolutely, I'll take care of that for you, no problem. And in the last 48 hours, I've been so attracted to my mother. I've been wanting to go visit her. She lives in Utah and I live in San Francisco. So this morning I booked a plane ticket. Yay. I get there usually about once every two years. But her generosity of spirit of wanting to take care of me in that moment had me want to go be with her, had me want to be around her, had me want to see her, had me want to spend time with her. So we can think, oh, that's only happening because it's a romantic situation. No, that can happen with any situation. Because we really appreciate knowing that the person giving that gift loves us, and they're, it's an offer of taking care. Hmm. Oh, that's good. I they're was looking out for your worried. well-being. They just got more attractive to you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I was worried because it felt like... It felt weird because at first when he offered it, I emailed you and I was like, is this going to mean that, you know, I, I can't ruin our friendship and I can't risk our friendship. It would be a disaster. And then after I just felt, yeah, closer um, to this person. So it's interesting. Um, yeah, it feels good. It feels good to have someone care enough to do something significant or even s- something small. Yeah. And and for everyone listening, when you're receiving something, you want to pay attention to the different, the difference in the feeling. Because while it might make you slightly uncomfortable to receive a large gift when you think you don't deserve, you get a great example with candy bar, no big deal, thanks, hand me that. <laughs> but something big, you'll have that nervousness, but see if the feeling that, that combines with the nervousness is a yummy good feeling, like the one I had with my mother that felt, felt taken care of, or if it's, ooh, I don't know about this. If it's an I don't know about this feeling in your gut, you're a smart person. Trust your gut. If there's a, and this meant for men too, smart men, trust your gut. If you're receiving that gift and you've got a I don't know about this feeling, there might be another piece to it that you've got to go back and clarify and make sure everybody's on the same page. Because, yeah, there are some people who give gifts that aren't gifts at all. They're trying to buy you into something. And it didn't sound like this was the case that you were speaking of at all, Marie. But it, that can happen, too. And, and in that case, your job is to say, wow, I'm not sure I can accept this because I really feel like this ob- obligates me to something that I'm not quite comfortable to, comfortable with. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. Um 
So I'm curious, uh, unless you feel a burning need to take it in a different direction, I wanted to ask you a question about meeting people out in the real world and chatting with them. Sure. Um, so what do you do when you see someone at like the grocery store or the coffee shop or something? And so what happened to me, it's when you, when you see people in passing it, it happens so quickly. And sometimes you're already out the door before you even realized, oh, that was an opportunity to connect with someone. Yeah. So, um, I'm just wondering if you have any tips around that. Yes. Give them any reason to talk to you. Smile, long eye contact. If you think you're about to miss the opportunity, say hi. Hi! <laughs> Create an opening for them to step into. Including if you're at the farmer's market, you could actually say something. Like, what is this weird fruit and how do you cut it? Do you eat it with the rind or what is this? You don't have to say anything brilliant. You don't have to have the perfect line. You just have to create the space to have someone come in. And as I was listening to the, <laughs> as I was listening to the Ready for the Right Guy um, summit, and I've heard other date. I think I just I read it. I heard it there. Or I read it somewhere in the last week or two. Some dating expert was talking about the first person who speaks loses all the power in the relationship forever. <laughs> it's just like, wait, what? what? No, no, that couldn't have been my telesummit. That was not on my telesummit. That was something I read probably in someone's blog. And I thought, okay, dating expert, that's an interesting psychological fact that you're throwing out there, but it doesn't really seem to apply to my life. Because on 121 first dates, most of them, I'd say about 100 of them were internet dates. And of the 100 or so internet dates that I had, I reached out to almost all of them. I reached out to probably 80 to 90% of them. And I had great dates and great second dates and great third dates and great fourth dates and great mini uh, courtships. And my beloved Dave and I have been together for over two years, and I talked first. I reached out to him, and he, I, I do not, I did not lose all the power in the relationship because I made the first move. I made the first move, but I didn't ask him out. I made the first move, which created an opening for him to ask me out, and he did. And that's all I'm asking women to do is to be open and have that moment face to face where. You smile and say, hiya, oh, yeah. <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. And don't worry about the make the first move, you lose all the power. Because if you don't make the first move and the opportunity is lost, there's no power to lose because you had nothing, you have, a, you have a missed opportunity. Okay. I hate missed opportunities. Me too, but I had, I have, um, I'm all like, oh my God, I just have to get this out and <laughs> tell you. I've had two different grocery store experiences. And one, I actually talked with the guy. And mm -hmm. I don't know if he was about to ask me out or if he was just making conversation. But I mentioned something about his, something he was buying. I don't know. I was like, oh, it looks like you're going to have a party or something. And then he asked me, we chatted a bit. And he kind of told me like what he did for a living, where he worked and all. And I was asking him about his work. And then... Uh, and then he said, so what are you doing for Halloween? And rather than saying, oh, I haven't decided yet, I said, oh, I'm going trick-or-treating with my friend and her kid. And then that was pretty much the end of the conversation. So I'll never know if he was going to invite me to his party. So I was kind of like, <laughs> you know. I'm Missed opportunity. <laughs> super cute, smart. Oh, my gosh, right? And then the other day, there was a gorgeous guy um, who came up behind me in line. But I was reading a magazine, and I noticed, like, so the, the conveyor belt where you put all your groceries was, like, long and empty. I, I was blocking the way, basically. So as soon as I realized he was behind me, I felt like I'd done something wrong. I was like, oh, I'm sorry, you know, and I put my magazine down, and I put the little divider down for him. And then I looked at him, and I was like, oh, my gosh, right? And... But I couldn't, I couldn't, I felt like I had done something wrong. So rather than talk to him, I took all of that amazing bubbly energy and I focused it on the checkout clerk. 
So we had a great mm. conversation and I totally ignored him the whole yeah. time. And it wasn't that I wasn't, it was just like, I felt so embarrassed and I did kind of look afterwards. I, I looked and I smiled, but by then it was like, I'd pretty much stonewalled him. So, um, yeah, missed opportunity. Yeah, they happen. Yeah. But it's so frustrating because it's so rare that you're actually in the same place at the same time with someone who you feel like you could talk to. And then I get all like, and, and another thing that happens is if I'm, I I mean, I'm really affectionate and bubbly and and friendly to people. So I'm constantly getting hit on by guys in their twenties and guys in their sixties and seventies. But men in their thirties and forties, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm nervous around the ones I'm attracted to. I don't know. Well, that could be, but there's something else that you want to consider, which is something that's not talked about in our culture at all. Our culture talks about how men have it easy because when they're forward and when they're out there and when they're expressing themselves, they're studs. But what we don't talk about is the other side, the ugly side, which is something that men have to constantly be aware of. They don't want to be the creep. They don't want to be the creepy guy. So you have a cute guy in your gym. He's not going to hit on you, even if he really wants to, if he's not going to talk to you because he doesn't want to be perceived as the creepy guy who hits on you at the gym or the creepy guy who hits on you at Whole Foods or the creepy guy who... So men, and they also don't know if you're single, and they also don't know if you're interested, and they also don't know all these other factors, and they don't want to risk being creepy. They'll respect you enough to let you alone. (laughs) It's it's kind of a tragedy, and you're not going to like my answer to this. You're not going to like my solution, which is, and women out there are not going to like it, and I'm really sorry a date online because that same cute guy in the Whole Foods is online and it's where he can actually go to meet women to have a date to see if he can have a relationship where he will not be perceived as creepy for the most part. I mean, even sometimes if a woman gets an email from someone she's not attracted to, no matter how polite it is, he's creepy. Hmm. So they have an uphill battle with that. The most decent guys that you want to be in a relationship with are terrified of being classified as a creep. And I actually just learned this. I just learned this from McDave. We've had a couple of conversations about this over the course of the last week that were eye-opening to me. Can you say more about that? There are filters that men have in place that are that they keep checked all the time. Starting with, I we just spent the weekend with some friends of ours, and this dear dear friend of mine um, has this beautiful tattoo along her clavicle bones, right along the top of her chest, that says "Celebrate the Good Life." And I and it, it's high; it's her clavicle bones. And I said, "Well, you know, you know about SJ's tattoo? It says this." And he said, "Nope." I've never seen it. And he meant it. I knew he meant it because he's totally free to tell me if he notices such things, and we love that. And and I said, what are you talking about? It's this enormous tattoo that runs all along our clavicle bones, <laughs> the front of her chest. And he said, yeah, no, it's part of the don't be creepy. I've never seen it. I never saw it. Wow. Yeah. So I must hang out with creepy people then, because my friends are always commenting on stuff like that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, if you're friends with them, they're able to take down a filter or two to let you see who they really are. So just consider yourself the inner circle. (laughs) (laughs) Hmm. Um, I'm not sure, Wendy, or do you have anything more to say about that? Okay. I'm not sure if we've talked about this before or not, but I think you, you spoke about it in the telesummit. And so I wanted to bring it up and that's the whole producing results. Um, and I wanted to talk about how like the different modes that we get into when we're producing results versus being receptive. Mm. Yeah. 
Um, Do you want me to just talk about it? Maybe. Yeah, I actually have kind of. Uh, I host uh, a lot of events. And I noticed sometime, I actually noticed this a few weeks ago where I was producing results. I was taking care of everybody. And I noticed it got to the point where I was making sure other people at the table, men, had what they needed from the waitress. That if they were leaving, that they had their bill. Like I was just totally in make sure everyone's okay mode to the point where it was probably kind of patronizing. And I had to apologize. I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I, you can You can handle it. So I'm wondering if there's a way to balance how to balance taking care of the results that need to be produced while also being feminine and not stressing myself out. Are you talking about being single and on a date or are you just talking about in the world? I'm talking about in the world. In the world. Yeah, if there's a way to balance the two. Yeah, you could actually decide. This, again, comes back to conscious choice. You could decide before you do any event to what level you're going to be producing results and to what level you're going to let it go. If it's your event, your name is stamped on it, your brand is stamped on it, you will be in production mode. And if you're not, you, you, better, you better darn well have hired someone to be in production mode for you. So you can be in production mode over her or him <laughs> producing an event. So that's an obvious place where you're not going to relinquish control. If you're out to dinner with a group of friends and you've invited everybody, you've been the host, you have a bit of an obligation to produce the results, but you could decide up front at what point you're going to let it go. So, okay, I'm going to host this dinner for 10 people. We're going to Jardinier, this lovely restaurant. The reservations are at 7 and everyone's going to pay their own, so I'm not going to have to worry about picking up the bill. What I'm going to be in charge of is making sure everybody has all the information to get there on time and that they know that they're paying. And I'm going to get to the restaurant a little bit early to make sure that they have the big enough table ready for us. And then once that part's handled, I'm going to be a guest at my own party. <laughs> Conscious choice. Conscious choice. You just want to let that go. Mm. I like that. And yeah. I know it's... at any point if you need to pick that back up again. Mm. But if you if you don't make the conscious choice, you're just going to be running on the energy of production. You're going to make sure the conversation at the table is going well, and that Sally at the in the middle there they got stuck in the middle and there's two separate conversations going on on either side of her. She's not talking to anybody. Now you got to make sure she's okay. And that, no, no, that's not your job. Your job, you have to decide when your job is done, what pieces are yours and what pieces are not yours. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Cause then it's, I mean, it, if, cause if I don't do that, I feel like it's almost to the point where I'm like cutting people's, meet for them or what you know it's like I have to take care of everything and make sure everyone's entertained every second and then I don't have any fun so yeah I, li I like that idea thank you yeah and sometimes they don't either yeah no they Especially don't people the, don't need to be the generative ones who want to generate their own stuff yeah yeah and that goes for everything that, that that's not just an event that's that can be for how you're going to spend your weekend with your family what parts are mine and what parts are not? And if somebody else has full accountability for another part and you're the mom, make sure you know that. You know, Jeff, we're going to go do this thing this weekend. Here's your part. Here's my part. Here are the kids' parts. Let's get the kids in here make sure they're aligned on what their parts are. And we'll go from there. Mm. Thanks, Wendy. Yeah. So we have just a few minutes left in the show. Parts Unknown is coming up in about 10 minutes. So I'm just wondering what you'd like to talk about for the rest of the show. <laughs> um, what I would like to talk about for the rest of the show. Or I can just ask more questions. Yeah, paying attention to your relationships so you're getting the most out of them. And just like I talked about figuring out what your part is for a party or for a weekend, figure out what your part is in the relationships with people in your life. 
so you're not overdoing and they're not or they're not overdoing you know if you're not doing enough you know, find out what enough for you looks like when you need to spend time with your best friend what's enough time and when you're with her or him what do you need from them what's their part what do you need from them in life what do you need from them to feel connected what do you need from them to feel appreciated and seen and make sure they know make sure they know what enough looks like oftentimes we run around with i'm not, i'm not happy because i'm not getting what i want or i'm not happy because i'm not getting enough of something or i'm not happy because he doesn't love me but we don't we're not able to articulate what I don't, I'm not happy because he doesn't love me. Well, what does love look like? What would it look like if he did? What, what would be the thing that he could do, say, be, or show that would indicate enough for you? And oftentimes we feel like that someone doesn't love us or care about us or respect us enough because we're not getting something, but we can't, we can't put our finger on it. We can't quantify it. And often, even if we could, we expect 100%. Well, what would be enough? Would 70% be better than nothing? <laughs> so figuring out for yourself what you need to be in great shape with your relationships with people and looking at what's enough. What's enough for you? What's enough for them? So everybody's getting the best end of the stick. And when they go over and above what's enough, you can actually acknowledge what that is and how great your life is. And you'll be playing a game called How Great Can You Stand It instead of I'm miserable because I don't get enough. I'm barely squeaking by. Mm. What about, Wendy, if you've asked for something and, like, how many times do you ask for something before you give up or scale back on the the level of um, the relationship? Well, it it depends on what it is. And what I know when I'm asking for something is it's always a gift. It's always a gift. Even being a parent, showing up every day for your child, it's a gift. I know people who don't, or I've heard of them anyway. (laughs) We read about them on television. We read about them and hear about them on television, right? But... Anything we give to each other is a total gift. Even if it shows up as an accountability, it's still a gift that you did it. So I ask and I let them know what it's going to provide if they give it to me and align on if they will or they won't. And if they say yes, but then they don't, then I then I ask again. And I find out if there was anything that they needed that I didn't know about that had them not give it to me in the first place. Maybe they needed something that I didn't know about for them to do their part. Maybe I had a part that I didn't know about. So if they say, oh, no, 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 I sorry, I just forgot. Okay. And then make sure that you have a timeline or a deadline uh, by when so it can get handled if that's a possibility for what you're asking for. Unless you're talking about behavior modification, then it then it's sort of instantaneously from when you've asked, right? And if they continue to not give you what you're asking for, even if they're telling you, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do it, then they're just showing you. They're showing you that they're not going to give you that gift. They're not interested in giving you that gift. They're hoping you're going to stop asking for that gift. And then in that moment, you have learned what you can trust them for. You can trust them for not doing that. And from there, you get to make a very informed, conscious choice at what level are they now going to participate in my in my life for some things it might be oh they still have total and full participation i'm just not going to expect that from them anymore because they're not interested or willing to give it and if i ask them for it they're just going to lie about it and say they're going to do it but they don't do it all right okay (laughs) i'll go get that from this person over here instead And for the really, really big things, that might be a deal breaker. It might be a deal breaker in your relationship. You said you'd provide it. You haven't been providing it. It's something I need. I was hoping I could get it from you, and I see that I can't. So I'm 
okay, we sorry, but we're going to have to end our relationship now. This doesn't work for me. Same thing with behavior modifications. Something I need from you, I need you to stop doing. You're not, you haven't stopped doing it. I've asked if you've, if there's anything you need in order to stop doing it, you keep doing it. I'm really sorry, that's a deal breaker for me. You might want to let them know it's a deal breaker before you say goodbye. <laughs> there's something I need from you. If you keep doing this thing, it's a deal breaker for me. You know, maybe you're an on-time person and your girlfriend is 45 minutes late for everything. And But maybe you still want to be her girlfriend. Maybe you don't want that to be a deal breaker. Maybe you're willing to accommodate the bullshit that it is. Sorry if I said that. I'm not supposed to. Um, that she is late. So what do you do? You want to keep the girlfriend, but she's 45 minutes late? You tell her to be there 45 minutes earlier. Done. Problem solved. <laughs> Yeah, I actually have a friend like that. And I do. I tell her, so I'm, are we going to show up? Like, we'll meet at 2.30. Are we showing up 2.30 real world time or 2.30 your time? <laughs> and then we kind of, <laughs> but I accept what happens is she comes to my house. So I just wait until she is outside before I put my coat and my shoes and my, I'll, I'll basically lose myself in whatever work I'm doing until she shows up at whatever time. Because otherwise, I'm I'm sitting there waiting for half an hour, upset, and uh, I've learned that it's just she has this kind of it's it's related to dyslexia, where she actually mm. has a trouble with time and maps and things like that. So I've I've forgiven her. I I I know that it's not disrespect because it does bother her. Yeah. Um, but there are other people who just don't have respect for my time, and therefore I just don't yeah. make plans with them. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, and you just want to understand what you can trust them for. Mm-hmm. Dave can tr- I can trust Dave to be on time. Dave can trust me to be about five to ten minutes late. <laughs> and it's not because I love him any less. It's because I'm optimistic about time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were on time today. I'm so impressed with you. Thank you. <laughs> Interviews, planes, you know, yes, I'm on time for those things. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Well, we have just a couple minutes left in this show, and it's always such a pleasure speaking with you. Um, you are going to be back here on CITR on Wednesday, January 21st at 10 o'clock. I'm going to be filling in for Caroline on Sexy in Van City, and we're going to be talking a little bit more flirty because it's after 10 o'clock. We can say a little bit more. Uh, so join us on Wednesday, January 21st if you want to hear uh, more saucy talk about love and relationships. Um, but, Wendy, is there anything that you'd like to add before we close the show? Oh, I just want to I just want to thank everyone for listening, and I just hope that what I said can really help both men and women see that they can, with the the understanding that it's a gift, that they can sort of release that grip that we have when it comes to needing what we need from people. Because you know they're either going to do it or they're not. They're not, and we're often so angry about things. I'd rather just have us see what we can be trusted for. You know. Mm. I appreciate what you said about the, the angry. Like it's. We may just because we need it, it doesn't mean that we have to turn it into an expectation. Yeah. Because yep. then we're angry when we don't get it. No, yeah, we can we can expect it and we can be angry and darn that's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Hmm. <laughs> well, on that note, thank you so much, Wendy, for being on the show. It's been such a pleasure and happy new year. I'll talk to you in a couple of weeks. Okay, sounds fun. Thank you so much. Thanks, Wendy. Have Bye, a Marie. Day. Bye. So again, that was Wendy Newman. She is the author of 101 First Dates. You can find her on her website, wendyspeaks.com. And you can find me on spiritualshow.com, mariebenard.com, or on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash spiritual show. And uh, yeah, so if you want to hear a little bit more saucy talk about love and relationships with us, uh, join us on January 21st. Well, I'll be Filling in at 10 o'clock for Sexy in Van City right here on CITR. And of course, I'll be back next Monday with another episode of Synchronicity. And coming up next in just a moment is Parts Unknown here on CITR. I want to send you lots and lots of love. Be well. Love you so much. 
You know what I'm saying? Chris loves saying namaste. <laughs> Have a great week. Ladies and gentlemen.